everybody. Um, welcome to our OFRC session on species rich grassland restoration. I'm Anna Eldridge, I'm the policy lead at Plant Life, specialising in grasslands and agriculture bro policy more broadly. And Plant Life aims to promote the restoration and preservation of rare and valuable habitats for wild plants and fungi in the UK and internationally. And today we are joined for a discussion which should be really interesting with Precious Theory of Earth Wisdom, Diana Donlan of Soil Centric, and Emma Rothero of Floodplain Meadows Partnership. Uh, so Precious is joining us from Zimbabwe, Diana is in Northern California, and Emma is in uh, the Malvern Hills um, in Herefordshire. So I wanted to just give a bit of an overview uh, before I hand over to these amazing panelists um, about plant life's perspective on species rich grasslands and why it's so important for us. Uh, so wildflower meadows are one of the most biodiverse habitats in the UK. They're home to common species that we all know and love like buttercups, clovers and daisies but they're also home to a lot of the rare and threatened species. They're biodiversity hotspots and can be home to up to 40 species of plants and fungi per square meter, which is rather remarkable within the UK context. Uh, these habitats support a myriad of other life from small mammals, invertebrates and bird life, all of which have seen significant declines in recent years. However, part of the reason why we've seen the decline is that 97% of UK meadows have been lost since the 1930s. And that is a staggering 7.5 million acres, which has been plowed up for agriculture, ag um, uh, agriculturally improved with the use of synthetic fertilizer or built on for development, urban sprawl, housing, et cetera. Uh, today, they cover less than 1% of UK land and a lot, 75% of that remaining grassland, species rich grassland, is in small disconnected fragments, which means that wildlife and wild plants cannot transfer across them as easily as they would were they to be in a connected system. The decline on grassland has resulted in a decline in the plants and fungi species that rely on those habitats, as I said. So we've seen a dramatic decline in round-headed rampion, early gentian, Spanish catchfly, spiked speedwell, as well as a number of other species. However, what's so interesting to us is that since 40% of UK land is pasture or semi-natural grassland, there is a huge potential for restoration here. We can bring back these grasslands and restore them to the species richness that they previously had. And in the UK, part of this focus is through, is looking at how that can be achieved through the design of the new environmental land management schemes. So, I'm really delighted that um, these wonderful speakers can join us today, all women, which I thoroughly enjoy as well. Um, so what I would like to do is hand over first to Emma Rothero from the Floodplain Meadows Partnership uh, to talk about the work that they're doing. Uh, as a way of introduction, Emma received a Master's in Applied Hydrology from the U University of Wales College Cardiff. She then worked for the Environment Agency for 12 years uh, when she took up the role of Floodplain Meadows Partnership Outreach Coordinator before becoming the Partnership Manager in 2018 with the goal to promote floodplain meadow restoration activities in England and Wales. Uh, so now I will hand over to Emma for her presentation. Thanks very much, Anna. Um, it's uh, it's great to be here, and thanks every everybody for hanging on to nearly the end of the conference to to listen to our workshop. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about diversity in floodplain meadows, working with nature for mutual benefits. So 
So floodplain meadows are a beautiful and ancient agricultural system that has evolved over many hundreds of years through an annual hay cut. This traditional management has resulted in the distinctive character of floodplain meadows we see today. They have evolved purely through the need for hay before the development of artificial fertilisers. Farmers took advantage of the natural fertility of floodplains and their large flat areas to make very highly prized and valuable hay to feed stock over winter. The result of such management has been the evolution of communities of grasses and flowers that thrive with the flood and drought cycle of floodplains, enabling them to work with nature rather than against it. Floodplains cover 7% of continental Europe, but up to 90% of them are degraded. Floodplain meadows are found across northern and central Europe from the Atlantic to the Urals with similar plant communities. Management is also similar throughout, typically a hay cut which may be followed by a second hay cut on more fertile sites or grazing. Floodplains across Europe have been traditionally managed as hay meadows and pastures for centuries. They therefore have a huge potential range and their contribution towards biodiversity and carbon capture is significant. In England and Wales, floodplain land use can be categorised as shown, with only 3.5% of floodplain land classed as neutral grassland, fen, marsh and swamp. But historically, most lowland floodplains in England were managed as grassland and meadow. Meadows are communities of diverse perennial herbs efficiently sharing above and below ground spaces. Together with earthworms and soil microbes, plant roots develop good soil structure, accumulating long-term storage of carbon as humic acids. Flood sediments are incorporated into the soil processes. This means that alluvial soils, such as those supporting floodplain meadows, grow deeper with each flood event, providing new soil to fill with carbon. The figure demonstrates that the roots of meadow plant species can grow to several metres deep, occupying large volumes of the soil. This ensures a more even distribution of carbon in the soil compared to, say, restored woodlands, where plant communities are more diverse, plant root systems occupy space more efficiently than if growing individually as a monoculture, allowing them to lay down carbon in a greater volume of soil. In floodplain meadow systems, where there is a diversity of plant species, soil structure is well developed. Good soil structure means more space for air and water. Where soils are compacted, their plant species diversity is reduced, as shown in the graph on the right hand side. Our data show that some of our oldest floodplain meadows have more than 40 different plant species per one metre squared. Within, in, within England and Wales, the stock of soil carbon beneath each floodplain land use was estimated. Carbon density, measured as tonnes per hectare, was found to be low in soils under arable or intensively managed grassland. Our unpublished figures for soil carbon beneath floodplain meadows suggest they are higher than any other floodplain land use, and we are currently undertaking further investigations into carbon sequestration and storage to confirm this. Our unpublished figure is shown in red um, as 109.4 tonnes per hectare. The relationships between plant diversity, carbon storage and soil structure form a virtuous cycle with no tensions between managing for soil carbon and biodiversity, but where one promotes the other, whilst remaining part of an agriculturally productive system. Based on current evidence, we conclude that floodplain meadows should be conserved and restored to boost both biodiversity and carbon sequestration rates. As I hope I'm demonstrating, floodplain meadows are one of the most sustainable land uses for floodplains in northern Europe. We therefore undertook a survey to determine the extent of restoration in England and Wales to help us understand what were the factors in a successful restoration project. This survey was undertaken over three years and funded by the John Elliman Foundation. We were able to look at 163 floodplain meadow restoration sites sorry, um, across 20 counties, equating to 733 hectares of floodplain meadow. Our findings were, very briefly, that neither previous land use nor restoration method affected outcome, that sufficiency and consistency of management was found to be significant, the significant determiners of project success, where sufficiency of management is defined as where all restoration measures are implemented effectively. So, for example, enough propagules were introduced, nutrients were managed effectively in advance and drainage infrastructure was maintained. Cons consistency of management reflects the importance of a regular annual hay cut. And finally, that private landowners, as opposed to public organisations or commercial farms, were found to score more highly in terms of their management sufficiency and are therefore linked to better restoration outcomes.
We've published a paper on this work and the link is at the bottom of the slide and there's more information on our website and I'm happy to share all this with anybody who wants to know more. So thank you very much for your attention. If anyone farms a floodplain meadow or farms floodplain land and would like to consider restoration of floodplain meadows, please do get in touch. Find out more about everything that I've said from our website or contact us directly following these email addresses. Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, what I was saying was that um, I'm going to choose to save all of the questions until the final, after the three presentations have been concluded, so we can have a bit more of a chat with all of the panellists, um, if that's okay. Um, so what I want to do now is uh, hand over to Precious. Um, so Precious is a training and development specialist in regenerative agriculture issues. She's an educator in holistic management and a seasoned community organiser in Zimbabwe. An organisation and network called Earth Wisdom to inspire change. And she is also a steering committee member and African coordinator for Regeneration International. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Precious now. Uh, thank you, Orna. Hi, everyone. And as has been said, thank you so much for hanging in there with us and uh, for giving us today your gift of your time. Um, okay, so I'm just going to share briefly on the species rich uh, grassland restoration, but mostly focusing on the tool that I've worked with, with the communities. So I'm so glad that Emma started ahead of me and um, I will just be sharing in form of stories and uh, pictures, just showing the kind of work that has been done. Because um, as you know, most of the African rangelands are really grasslands where the megafauna, which is big uh, or large grazing animals, evolved with these grasslands. And these have been important for ages uh, for our people, our wildlife, and all forms of life, including water. And in recent times, we are also getting to learn and find a language of how to share with communities on the importance of grasslands in contributing to reversing climate change by pulling down carbon and storing it through the photosynthetic processes. So as has been said on my name, I work here with communities through Earth Wisdom and uh, I'm also working with Regeneration International as well as providing some trainings through the Savory Institute as an accredited uh, field professional. Let's look at most of our rangelands. My, uh, my experiences are also in working with mostly pastoralists and some agro-pastoral communities who are also doing crops. Um, but what I've experienced in most, most of Precious, most so sorry to interrupt you. Um, it appears that your slides are zoomed in, so oh. we can only see uh, most of it, but just not the far left side we can't see. So if, really? you, if you exit uh, okay. end the show and then try try going into full screen again and just see, okay. see if that works. How is it looking? Uh, it's still too large. Okay. So how about we just present from this view? Yeah, sure. I think that's that's fine. Okay, maybe we'll I see all the words. Just a few. Yeah, you may not see all the words, but uh, please forgive me for that. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Technology. <Okay. laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So I was just going to share that in my experiences, um, most of the African rangelands or grasslands have really faced uh, desertification, mostly due to uh, practices. Some of them have been turned to croplands and eventually it has caused pastoral communities to suffer a great deal. So because of time, I am, unfortunately I had written so that you guys can be reading as we go, uh, but I'll still just go uh, ahead uh, and go to the next of the slides. Um, so this, there are lots of social impacts because of the degradation of uh, grasslands, um, mostly insecurities, um, wars where pastoral communities are fighting for grasslands and uh, for pasture. 
And then in some parts of Southern Africa, we've had floods in my own country and uh, these perpetual droughts, whether or not we have good rains, because the most important thing as we are learning is that when you cover your soil with living plants, which are grasses, you also have a big capacity to hold water because once the soil has enough carbon, it can store up to eight times more uh, water. So you need those grasslands to be alive as you harness soil, but also produce food for your livestock. And so it displaces most uh, farmers if the rangelands are bare. So my work also involves using holistic management as a framework to bring the connections of the work that we do on the land, our decisions every day, how they impact our land and then eventually our whole life. Um, because mostly as we are learning as well, we are so attuned as humans to just managing things in parts and never in holes. And whatever decision we do on a small piece of land, it affects the next village either through flooding or you know when we are hungry, you have then people stealing cattle from the next villages. All that is connecting back to the health of the grasslands. So whatever work we do on the ground, whether through industrial agriculture, it has what we call unintended consequences of perpetual community suffering. Um, so I'll jump quickly to, because of our time, to sharing a little bit of the work, what we do in holistic management, and which is what I train in communities. Uh, we zoom in on in the rangelands restoration. This is a four key insights as penned out by Alan Savory, who's the originator of holistic management. Um, nature functions in holes, so we cannot afford to manipulate parts. For example, a community cannot thrive with just crops and while the rest of the land is dying because it leads to conflict with wildlife, conflict with wildlife and livestock when you are now fighting for resources. And then um, also it eventually goes down to hitting us hard on uh, disabling the photosynthetic processes and our land is no longer able to produce food and hold carbon and water. And then we have the brittleness scale, which says every environment is different. So every time you're looking at whole systems, you manage them differently. You cannot use the same tool. So we have lots of different tools in the regenerative toolbox, but then always work with your context to know what works in your area. So in grazing, time is more important than numbers. That's the third key insight, which is completely different from what we were learning from school. Um, where you have a predetermined caring capacity of an environment. But if you are to really enable and bring back the, the biodiversity, you have to work with the uniqueness of your land and monitoring your land every time using the tool of animal impact. Um, okay, so, and then I'm just going to jump in to say, this picture is showing, um, let's see, I, I hear that you can only see the left side. Um, this picture is showing a, 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 a picture that says we are now using livestock to replace or mimic what used to happen when we had the large grazing herbivores in our wild lands in Africa. So they will chip the soil, dung and urinate, and then their gut is adapted to processing the, uh, the complex carbohydrates that are in the grasses, which led to grasslands, water systems to thrive. And then when, of course, when uh, industrialization came and division of, of wild animal game parks, making them into national parks, those corridors of flow of wildlife that were led by pack hunting animals were broken down. And then that's when we started seeing mineral cycles breaking backwards and we have lots of mariband or oxidizing grasses because the mineral cycles are now dysfunctional, the water cycles are dysfunctional, the solar energy is no longer flowing to produce food through photosynthesis processes. And so then that's how deserts have been advancing. And that is the root cause and uh, in holistic management, we found the tool of animal impact to then have uh, work on the same way that the megafauna worked. Um, in my job, my role is to work with communal lands. I work with different partners, but then the sharing of knowledge is different because you have to break this dense information into things that people can relate with because also these problems lead to social uh, instabilities. And so this is what I'm going to share as some pictures of uh, some of the changes that we've seen in places where we've used holistic 
land and livestock management, uh, where we have we have healed uh, river systems. Josh, please let me know if you can see, because I'm just rounding off here. So these are just examples. And then this one, 2006 to 2014, the whole rangeland has completely changed and wildlife are enjoying where we have a diversity of species. And remember, when you're talking about diversity of species, one of the most important things also is to have broad-leaved grasses that have a bigger capacity in the photosynthetic uh, processes. And also those broad-leaved grasses are also palatable to the wildlife and our livestock. And then this is in South Africa, farmer security, a fence line uh, difference where one is using the tool of including livestock in the management of their land. And uh, so what we can start doing now, um, mindset transformation, build diversity, keep leaving roots in the soil, rebuild the reverence of the earth and the natural processes. We are so used to being managers and manipulators that we have lost the art of learning and then build cross-cutting collaborations. And at the end, I just say, do something no matter how small to start building back the importance of the grasslands. And these are some of the resources that you can tap into. The Savory uh, website has a lot of uh, resources on the library for you to learn, buy a holistic management book. Also watch the Kiss the Ground movie, which has uh, a bigger view of uh, what, what I'm talking about in brief. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope this was helpful. <coughs> It certainly was. It's fascinating. I always love the presentations and the, I think the images are really striking to see those differences between uh, a land before it's restored and afterwards. Um, so thank you very much, Precious. I now want to hand over to Diana Donlan. Um, so Diana is the co-founder and executive director of Soil Centric, which is a non-profit based in California and designed to accelerate engagement in the regenerative agriculture and ecosystems restoration. Prior to founding Soil Centric, Diana established Soil Solutions at the Center for Food Safety, which is how I know Diana so well, and produced a short film for the Paris Climate Conference COP21 and the launch of the Four Per Thousand initiative. So I shall hand over to Diana. Thank you, Honor. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm giving the perspective from California, which is a very large state, um, the largest state in terms of population in the United States. We have 40 million people. Um, we are slightly larger in land mass than the country of Germany. Um, and we have a Mediterranean climate. Um, this is a picture that I took of some elk in a national park uh, not far from my home um, on the Point Reyes National um, Peninsula. And you can see that in California, this is a pretty uh, very common view as we have these rolling hills with grasses and then we have oak woodland in sort of the folds of these hills. Diana, like, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Will you please hit play on your keynote? Oh, sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, so shall I advance to the next slide or do you? I just, there, okay. How are you? How are you? Um, so here's a map of California that shows uh, the different types of vegetation that we have. And one thing that I'd really like to underscore, I'm sure everyone has heard about the extreme fires that we've had in the last several years. And that's really been a game changer for us because we have like, the Mediterranean, this very dry climate where we only get rain um, at certain times of the year. Typically, we get rain from about October to about March, and then it doesn't rain again. Um, but that window of rain has been narrowing, and we've been having extreme droughts in the last years and then very um, severe fires. Uh, the term that's used most often when talking about the land that we have is a range land, and that um, if you look at this map, I, I don't know if my pointer shows, but this brown center part is our central valley where most of the nation's fruits and vegetables are grown and then exported to the rest of the United States. Um, so that's predominantly industrial agriculture. And then you see this band of light green, those would be our grasslands. And then the darker green would be these oak woodlands that um, are 
sort of part and parcel of, of this um, ecosystem. And then the purple are our are forests. So we have quite a bit of forest, especially in the north. Um, so California uh, is also a biodiversity hotspot. We have more than 6,000 native plants um, and about a little slightly more than half of the, the state is rangeland. Um, so it's a huge area. Now, often when you hear of the United States and you hear of prairies, um, that's quite different. That's the middle part of the country where the corn and soy is grown. And those are characterized, these prairies are characterized by very, very deep, rich topsoil in states like Iowa um, and Illinois. And that um, soil was formed first by the receding great glacials uh, from the Canadian, coming down from Canada. And then um, with the animal impact that Precious mentioned, the migrating herds of bison um, and the synergies between the bison and the, the grasses that created this very deep root system. So that's not exactly what we have in California. And also the threats that we face here are very different because we have such a large population. The threat to our rangelands are primarily from development. Um, so encroaching from the areas surrounding big cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco and San Jose. Um, whereas the threats to the prairie grasses in the um, Midwest are more associated with industrial agriculture. Um, I included this picture because I wanted you to see what a, another typical landscape. I didn't take this picture, but you see the grasses and then you see the oak woodland. Um, and what's become quite clear is that these grasslands are now more reliable um, a carbon sink than, than trees because of the fire danger. And there was a study done two years ago at the University of California, Davis. It, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of intuitive, but um, if you think about it from the fire perspective is there's so much emphasis on forests, but forests are vulnerable to these fires because most of their carbon storage is above ground in um, the woody biomass and in the leaves. Um, so in this context of fire and drought, grasslands are a more resilient carbon sink um, for 21st century California, primarily because they um, rebound more quickly too. You can go by an area that's ex uh, experienced fire and within a matter of months, the green grasses will be coming up again anew, whereas um, a forest will take um, decades to recover. So I wanted to touch quickly on a couple of big projects um, that this most sort of iconic project um, that is well known internationally is this Marin Carbon Project that studied the impact of putting a little bit of compost on these rangelands and, and measuring the biological response. Um, if you look again at the map, this sort of mustard color um, indicates where rangelands are. So there's a tremendous opportunity to not only heal these landscapes by using animal impact, but also by um, putting a little bit of compost on them. And then um, that is a food source, of course, for uh, the, the microbes underneath. Um, and the um, significance of this cannot be overstated because um, if we were to apply compost to um, rangelands in California, it, the offset potential is enormous. And this project, uh, which was initiated in 2008, has been uh, replicated throughout the state. There's also our state um, has a very high functioning um, program called the Healthy Soils Program, which has selected over 600 projects, a demonstration projects that farmers and ranchers can apply to. Um, I won't get into the specifics, but they've given out um, over $40 million in grant funds since the founding of this project. And the um, they incentivize, of course, things like compost application, mulching, um, hedgerows, proper grazing and so forth. Um, and this is something that people are very excited about this healthy soil program. Um, and California has really aggressive um, climate targets for greenhouse gas reduction. And this is just one of many programs. 
Um, and then I'm just going to end by showing you some of the diversity in our state. So this is the Carrizo Plain. This is what's called a super bloom. Um, I took this photo um, two years ago after um, a rain and you can see just the incredible um, patches of yellow. As far as the eye can see, those are flowers on these grasslands. Um, the picture to the right is of uh, the poppy is the orange flower. That's our state flower. Um, you can see vast meadows of this beautiful flower. Um, and then I included this picture on the left. There's a little flower called baby blue eyes. And on the right, it's what Precious was referring to. Do you see this standing matter that's oxidized? And that's what happens when you don't have animal land um, impact on the landscape. So this particular picture um, there used to be herds of antelope that would come through here, but um, their numbers have diminished. And so um, there isn't that animal impact and it, it does lead to oxidation and it makes it harder for the flowers to come up the next year. Um, and finally, this picture is circling back to the first one where I showed you where the animal impact was happening, where those elk were um, in the Point Reyes National Seashore. This is what they were munching on, this beautiful array of uh, grassland flowers, so a very healthy ecosystem because it was in balance with the plants and the animals. Um, so thank you very much. That is fantastic, Diana, thank you so much. So I'm gonna ask if Josh can bring all of the panelists up onto the screen so we can have a bit of a discussion um, and just make sure that you're off mute if you wanna jump in and respond. Um, so as is my prerogative as the facilitator, I'm going to take the first questions for myself, which is terribly mean, but I have them. Um, so what I think is interesting is that in the last few years, there's been a much higher level of attention and discussion around the soil carbon potential and the sequestration potential um, that grass and restoration can have. And I know that there have been a number of discussions at this Oxford and at previous ones about how we can see grassland restoration as a climate solution. But what I'm interested in seeing and having a and asking the panelists about is where they see the synergies between managing land for um, soil carbon and addressing the climate emergency with managing soils for biodiversity and to address the ecological emergency. Um, so we've seen some beautiful pictures, but how do you see these two, um, two tensions playing out, the, the carbon and the biodiversity together? You might need to say who goes first, Anna. <laughs> yeah, well, why didn't you, go, Emma? you broke the silence, so I think that puts you oh. in the hot seat. <laughs> uh, well, for, I mean, from our perspective, um, we think that both benefit, both um, carbon storage and biodiversity benefit from good soil structure, um, and therefore good soil management is key. In practice, this means being very careful in in north northern European areas anyway, and um, being especially careful when conditions are wet. And if the soil cannot bear much weight, then you shouldn't be um, uh, managing or going on it. Uh, if stocks start to poach or vehicles start to rut the ground, then they should be removed because that would reduce your potential for both biodiversity and soil carbon. Um, in the presentation, I showed that um, I showed evidence showing that increasing biodiversity means root diversity allowing plants to lay down more carbon in a greater volume of soil. So this concept of plant diversity, carbon storage and soil structure forming a virtuous cycle, I think is a really key message. Yeah, I think to Precious's point about managing holistically, I mean, I think it, we, we always run a danger when we just measure for one thing. And so if we're just measuring for, for soil carbon and not looking at the suite of benefits that come with grasslands, um, you know, we're missing the bigger picture because the biodiversity, the carbon, um, all these ecosystem services, if you will, um, the water retention, they all spiral upward or downward depending on our management system. So we can, if we, if we, you know, as Precious said, even if we do a small little thing and we, we push the lever in the direction of complexity, then we get all these benefits. If we push the lever in the direction of um, reductionism, then we get a cascade of problems. 
Yeah, uh, thanks, Diana, for mentioning that, and Emma as well. So I was just going to say it's almost impossible to separate <laughs> both because if a, if, if, if a grassland is efficient in capturing soil carbon, which means photosynthesis is functioning well and all the other feedbacks, you get lots of diversity. So if you have a bare land, you are losing carbon, you're losing water, and then the rest uh, works uh, the opposite. So looking at it from a complex perspective helps us then know that whatever management we put in place, we will have a feedback. So our choice is, do we want a positive feedback or a negative one? Fantastic. Um, I think we can probably all agree that we want a positive one. Um, <laughs> if, but it is significantly more complicated than that. But my other, the other question that I wanted to ask is, you know, we've got on this panel someone from Zimbabwe, someone from California. If we're looking at the global restoration of grasslands and we're looking at the the worldwide uh, destruction that we have seen of grasslands and the reduction of um, soil fertility across all grasslands how do we work together globally to, to find those solutions is it a un situation is it grassroots how do we tackle this um as a global society as opposed to in small incremental local responses or is that what's needed diana since you did the un before do you want to take that <laughs> well i think that you know I, what was when i was thinking about this presentation i was thinking about how grasslands um don't get their due and i think they do have a bit they are overlooked as an ecosystem overall um because you know, they, they aren't as, as dramatic as some. Um, and certainly um, not to pick on forests because I love forests, but um, you know, there's so much attention paid to um, reforestation and, and very little, um, oftentimes when people see a grassland, they see just an open space that's ready for development of some sort, often a paving over and a ceiling of that surface. And so I think that um, we have a huge opportunity, particularly with birders, because so many bird species depend on healthy grasslands. Um, there's some beautiful work that's been done down in Chihuahua, Mexico. Um, a man named Alejandro Carrillo has used, um, this is, is part of the Savory Hub, I believe, and they've done this massive restoration in the Chihuahuan desert, an area that had become desertified. And one of the, their key findings has been that they, all this bird life has come back because the birds nest, of course, in these grasses and take cover and also eat the seeds and so forth. The seed bank is in the soil. We just need to rejuvenate it. So I think that we, when you have a, a wonderful story of success, it's important to highlight it. But I also think that we have some natural allies that we could um, you know, partner with, such as the birding community. Fantastic. So what I'm going to do now um, is open it up to questions from the audience, which are going to be fed through to me. Um, I've already got a few, but if anybody has any questions, please just throw them in to the chat box on your screen and they will be sent through to me. Um, so one of the first questions that came through was uh, for Emma, I would say, um, and wanted to look at what was the impact of water pollution on floodplain meadows and how the, the upstream pollution would impact those habitats um, negatively. Uh, well, the issue for floodplain meadows in the UK um, and across Northern Europe is the amount of phosphorus that comes in onto the meadows through river flooding. And obviously phosphorus comes from a range of different sources in the wider catchment. Um, and uh, one of the things that meadows are really good at, however, is absorbing those nutrients and producing a hay crop. So if you can balance the, the nutrients that come in with a hay cut taken at the right time, then you should be able to manage that um, that nutrient cycle through effective management. So as long as you take your hay cut early in the season, say end of June, mid-June, when the nutrients are at their most um, dense above ground, 
then you should be able to balance it. Um, that said, obviously, where we get increasing, um, increasingly high levels of phosphorus in river catchments, um, that can become um, a little harder. Uh, we, we've we've done work which shows um, huge amounts of phosphorus being deposited um, on some species rich meadows, um, but they're still able to be biodiverse if they're managed well. If they're managed well, and I think yeah. that is the, the big challenge is that for a, a lot of people, these it is a very complicated system and it takes a lot of education and understanding to really digest what it is that is being required of them. And that's why having facilitators and educators like yourselves are so important so that people can really understand what it is that they should be doing and adopt best practices. Um, so another question that has come in was a clarification for Diana um, about the idea of applying compost to rangelands um, to restore soils. Is that um, there was a little bit of additional detail that people wanted was whether there that means that there's not sufficient livestock moving across to use um, sort of natural um, animal waste or is that coming out of cities and, and food waste that's being returned to the land? Um, do you want to just give a bit more detail about that? Yeah, so the marine, I, I would, um, whoever asked the question, I would um, encourage you to go to the Marin Carbon Project website because um, as I said, this project started in 2008. So they have quite a bit of data now that shows um, the, the long-term impact of what they've done. And they've done several different things. They've had plots where they've just applied, um, I think it was a half inch of compost on an acre and then another one where it's like a quarter inch and they would measure the, the biological response weight, um, rate. But yes, that compost was coming from municipalities. San Francisco has a very, um, I don't know if aggressive is, aggressive is the right word, but a very um, uh, proactive, proactive um, <laughs> composting program. And most of the city's compost does get, uh, or the organic waste from the city goes out into a facility, is composted, and often that is returned to vineyards um, in the wine growing regions. But um, I believe the Marin, Compo uh, Marin Carbon Project bought some of that compost and, and um, used it for their particular program. But yes, it's it's a partnership between the cities and what they produce and then um, this, this particular project. And the state has since gotten involved. Um, and as part of the Healthy Soil Program, you can use that um, application of compost. Of course, it's quite expensive and it does have its limits. Um, and then some of their trials have also included ruminant animals as well as the compost. So it's, you know, they, they have changed the variables um, and have a whole suite of different studies that they've done. Fantastic. Um, now, I thought that this was a quite an interesting uh, question that had come in was that in the UK uh, there has been a, a campaign to reintroduce beavers into certain river systems in order to manage flow um, which has led to uh, some floodplain restorations as um, it's it stopped the fast flow of the water and created um, these new habitats to thrive. Um, that said it's been fairly controversial um, and has resulted in in quite a, a strong uh, response from some communities. Um, so the, the question specifically was directed to Precious about whether um, beavers are used and can be used in um, South Africa and Zimbabwe. Um, I'm not 100% sure about their native um, <laughs> value. Um, but perhaps there's another species that could similarly be used. And um, but that said, I would be also interested in in Diana's response afterwards about how they can be used in states where they are more um, right. native. So in, in, in the general sense, I haven't heard of any place in Africa where there are beavers because they are not native to the continent. Um, so. I personally don't know of anyone who has tried to introduce them. And uh, especially in my work, we work with what's local 
in the area, what is hardy and adapted to the area, uh, because every uh, grazer in that area is suitable even in its gut to then digest the uh, the, the complexes in the in the carbohydrates of that particular area, and if you want to improve the grassland species, you use the adapted uh, mammals of that area, and then grass seeds keep in the soils for years, and then those mammals would then enable the soils and break them up to start a new growth, and then eventually the river systems come because you are harvesting water through slowing it down by leaving standing grasses and then you put your water in the underground water storage and then that's how you have your springs you do not have beavers well we do have beavers in the states and yeah. um there are some people that are very vocal about um reintroducing beavers and to allowing them to do what beavers do um which is and they have a, a little uh saying that um, it's quite easy to remember, and that is um, they they call beavers nature's engineers um, that slow it, spread it, and sink it. And that what the it is is water. So they slow the flow of the water, they spread the the flow of the water, and they sink the spread of the water. Um, and where beavers are absent, the water may come through an ecosystem too quickly and then leave it, um, and it may you know, saturate one area and miss another area. So what the beavers do so effectively is that they slow the water down, they spread it out, and then they sink it into the soil carbon so that the that it will be held there as, as green water. Okay, I'm going to take two questions together from the, um, from the chat. So uh, someone has asked, um, to have your opinions on extensive wood pasture um, and whether having wood pasture might allow uh, for an even more dramatic ability to create healthy soils and soil carbon sequestration. Um, and then in, on top of that, we've also had a question about the um, opportunity for silvo pasture systems on floodplains. Um, so I'll ask Emma to address that in her response. Um, but, uh, Precious, do you want to, um, address whether you think wood pasture versus grasslands, um, it has the potential for greater carbon levels and healthier soils? So I think, um, most of my responses will always go back to contextual relevance. Um, we have some places where wood, uh, woodlands thrive very well. Um, for example, in my region where I come from, we have tick forests, large and vast ones, but then they always complement or work together with the grasslands because that's where most of our water is really generated and captured, and then it flows into the next uh, grassland. So I wouldn't separate um, wood pasture and grasslands, but I would say in each area, when you put the relevant land management, you grow the plant life or grass life or wood life that was always in that area. So every time you are managing, you are managing to suit a complex environment so that it thrives in its uniqueness with its biodiversity without you manipulating. Because also I think I'm talking mostly from a background of really large, vast lands, thousands of hectares, which you can not exactly manage to plant trees except if you were to promote natural management that will enhance local species to thrive. So I think that's, yeah, that would be my background and my response. Emma, do you want to um, add anything to that or address the, the question of silver pastures within a floodplain meadow context? Um, I think historically there's not much evidence for extensive tree cover in in floodplains in the UK particularly certainly not in England um, although we're currently researching that at the moment um, there are some examples of where wood meadows are being recreated um, to have a look at how effective those are um, I don't have any figures about um, 
about how much extra carbon you might store as a result of um, mixing grasslands um, and woodlands on floodplains. Um, my my suspicion is that the grasslands give you your best your best option because they're what has most typically been used in the last 1,000 years on floodplains and have evolved to um, cope with that cycle of flooding and drought. Um, and so you've got that wonderful diversity of species that puts down all that carbon. I'm not sure that bringing trees into that mix would add much to that if you uh, you don't want too much shading on a species rich meadow because you lose your your um, uh, your diversity of meadow plants. Um, but you know I, I don't I don't know because we haven't seen very many examples of it. And Diana, anything to add on that? Well, I think to Precious's point, I think it's important to dis, um, distinguish, are we talking about wild landscapes or are we talking about managed you know, farming or, or ranching landscapes? Uh -huh. And I think when we're talking about um, wild landscapes that it's always important to, to, to know, you know what nature has intended to be there and and then if uh, management is required, then you know it's just a, a slight um, to, to let nature lead and the humans you know put in some sort of uh, minimal response um, as necessary. But if we're talking about a ranching or farming landscape, I think there are some big opportunities, uh, particularly for silvopasture, um, where you where you have you know uh, I've seen some examples in Argentina where um, just planting, you know, trees intermittently in a grassland area that's that's being managed um, for, by a farmer or a rancher um, has had tremendous res results. Um, so of course, sometimes those grazing animals like a bit of shade, um, and then sometimes you know you're providing another food source for um, migrating species. Um, it's always best to you know be really thoughtful and intentional about what species you're planting. Um, but it could also help um, farmers with another income stream if you plant, say, um, a fruit producing crop. Um, and so then you would have, you know, if uh, you have apples as well as goats, um, then you would have, you know, in two different income streams, especially as the weather becomes um, less certain. It's better for these farmers and ranchers to diversify. Um, so that you don't have all your eggs in one basket. So one of the uh, questions that we've got um, looks at the human footprint on the land. So we've talked a lot about animal footprints on the land and how by moving um, livestock across, we can create, mimic that natural system. Um, but to what extent do we need to allow for um, humans to be living within these restored grassland areas um, and so the person has asked about whether we can have low impact dwellings um, for occupants who are acting as land stewards um, in a recognition that we need both homes and employment um, as well as this natural environment so creating a system by which um, human and environmental life can function together in harmony as opposed to be considered as attention to each other. Mm. And so Precious, given your work on, on communities yeah. and in community engagement, do you want to, to take that? Yes. Um, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to say, remove humans and let nature be, because uh, already our the natural landscapes have been split into reserves. Into, so it's all human interaction and some of the decisions we are seeing them now the national parks these reserves are the worst degraded as well because they've closed off animal corridors so to a certain extent that's also a huge impact of human interaction um i guess our work now as a group of regenerators lobbyists or our interest is how can we then create a relationship where every human being takes themselves as a student of the natural environment that they are living in because i think it's it's almost impossible to separate ourselves but i think our language and trainings they now focus on building that relationship 
of understanding whole systems, of looking at holes instead of parts, at also taking off the mentality of extraction. When you look at a piece of land, all you're thinking about is your harvest. But how about what are you also planting into this land? So the only way we can minimize our negative impact is to have a reverential uh, relationship with the natural systems that we live in and share as much on regenerative practices so that everyone uses the diverse tools that we have according to the relevance in their context. Uh, Diana, is there anything you'd like to add? Well, when Precious was speaking, I was thinking about circling back to this, you know, extreme fire danger that we now face um, in California. And for many years, the conventional thinking was to um, suppress fire. And there were native communities in the northern part of the state in particular that had always used fire as a management tool. And um, they were forbidden from starting small spot fires, what they call them. Um, and of course, all this fuel load accumulated, and then we've had these catastrophic fires. So now um, there's a dialogue going on with uh, with our native communities and relearning some of their, their wisdom about fire and using it as a tool and, and really uh, being careful not to let the fuel load accumulate. Um, so I think to the extent that we can, you know, um, avail ourselves of indigenous wisdom, um, we'd be better served. Can I can I add can I add one thing on her as well? Um, certainly in a in a meadows context, um, you wouldn't have meadows without human intervention. That's how they have evolved. They're absolutely um, intrinsically linked to one another. Um, and over the last millennia that people have been managing grasslands in in our part of the world, um, the the evolution of that kind of synergy of flood, drought, grass growth, hay cut, animals um, is a perfect use of a system which occurs in this climate. So um, obviously, if you take one element out of that, then it will be completely out of balance. Um, I don't think you can separate people from the landscape. We've been here too long. Um, and there may be certain parts where it's appropriate to do that. But you have to be very careful about um, those decisions in that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and, and sort of stop respecting, if you like, the interaction that humans have had with our with the world and the positive effect that we have had on it. It's not, you know, I don't think we should say that humans are negative. We've, we've you know, we've worked wonderfully well with the systems that we've had until fairly recently. Well, I think we are coming to the end of our session, um, but I was minded that uh, Precious was saying in her presentation about trying to do something small and start, get started. Um, so I'm just wondering if the three of you could think up something small and easy um, for our audience to do themselves as a way of starting to think about grasslands restoration and the importance of species rich grasslands. Um, from my end, I think online and everywhere, there are lots of resources of visual demonstrations where someone can share knowledge without knowing the full science, but just showing visuals, even in your garden or using small tools to show how much soil can be kept together by a thriving grassland, soil, water, and you can then explain about carbon by just showing demonstrations or growing some food just to show the importance of that diversity. I think that's absolutely true. The kind of visuals of it are pretty astounding and you don't need to necessarily fully understand the science behind it to just appreciate what it is to have a healthy soil versus an infertile one. Um, so Emma, is there anything that you can think of a small, small little thing that somebody could do to start helping to, to make this shift? Um, well, from the other perspective, thinking about where you're buying your meat um, and whether you can source um, uh, animals that have got a pasture for life certification, for example, so they're entirely grass fed, or if you can find um, local producers who um, grow their beef and lamb on species rich meadows, then consumers can go a long way in helping to make that shift. There's a demand for it. 
Absolutely. I think that that is critical. And some of those certification schemes can really help us to know our farmer and understand that we are purchasing from a system that really values what we value too. Um, so Diana, um, on the spot, the last one to go. So I was going to say what Emma said, which is to, to seek out regenerative producers um, to support because it's very hard work and they do deserve our support. Um, so if somebody's doing it right, um, and it's really exciting when you find someone. Um, we have somebody in our neck of the woods that produces um, almonds in a regenerative fashion. Um, and they let animals graze in the almond orchard. And this orchard was only planted in 2004 and they've already grown 18 inches of topsoil, which is absolutely <laughs> incredible. So, um, you know, they're, they're, they have all these benefits of the biodiversity, but they also have a crop and then we can just buy the almond butter and it's a win, win, win for everyone. So I would encourage people to seek out regenerative producers and support them and also to support the organizations that are doing this good work. They do need our support. There are a lot of um, private organizations and charities that really um, could use um, financial support or like writing letters and to your you know, state or local um, government and saying that this is important to you. So there, there are many avenues for action as a citizen and, and as an eater. Thank you all. Well, I think that's a fantastic place to finish. So I am going to thank uh, my three wonderful panelists, Diana, Emma and Precious, and our audience for joining us on this evening, which is the last day of FRC. Um, so thank you very much. And I hope you enjoyed the discussion. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.